welcome everyone. And uh, so this is the, our second lecture started um, for the academic year, started uh, uh, September this year. And uh, so the Provost Lecture Series was initiated last October. And uh, so, so in, it's almost a, exactly about a, a year, as you can see. So we have covered, covered many lectures um, celebrating um, our OIS faculty members only. And the purpose is that we want to provide a platform to celebrate milestones in the careers of uh, our faculty members. Um, so it covers from, for example, promotion, um, tenure promotion, and also for faculty members receive awards. And finally, also for faculty members uh, who are going to retire. So in the past, in the past year, we celebrated uh, Professor of Scotland and Ichiro Maruyama, so both retired in the past year. We also have many professors who um, got promoted uh, to full professor or uh, uh, associate professor with tenure. And Professor Christ Christine Lascom two weeks ago gave a lecture to, um, so to celebrate her recent award. And so today, so I'm very happy to, to kick off our um, lecture to celebrate uh, Professor Sase to be promoted to full professor. And just very quickly, I want to um, again thank uh, many people from different divisions within OIS to, to make uh, the Provost Lecture Series a success. Uh, so in particular, people from the Office of the Provost. And uh, so it actually uh, takes a lot of time and effort to, to prepare the lecture and uh, to, to get the snacks and make a coffee and for the cleanup. And uh, so, so I hope people can say, uh, thank them, you know, during the, the coffee break. And also Patrick Kennedy, who is the engineering support section leader, he has been helping us to, to create gifts. It's uh, kind of with personal messages and so on and also the team from uh, CPR, so I see Heather is here, and also all your team members, thank you. So, so they help us to, uh, to make the poster, to make the design, and also the video recording, thank you. Um, so as I indicated today, so we, we have Professor Sase, and we have actually several more uh, lineup, and the next one will be given by Professor Yabin Chi, to celebrate several um, international awards he had received in the past year. So we also have uh, Professor Satoshi Mitarai. And so Satoshi, I just, uh, I, I found the picture when I searched Google. I, I guess that's the picture uh, taken when you first got here. Do you, do you remember? No, I don't. Okay. Um, and uh, so besides these four professors, we probably also have two to three more. Um, so based on uh, some recent results from um, the, their recent tenure and promotion. And so more information will be up. Uh, so with that, I'll hand the floor to Professor Tadashi Yamamoto, who will be the chair uh, to introduce Professor Sase. OK, thank you, uh, Sase-san, for setting up my presentation. <laughs> and congratulations, Sase-san on your well-deserved deserved promotion to the uh, uh, current promotion. And uh, as a colleague who joined OIST almost at the same time, uh, it is uh, 11 or 12 years ago, I'm really happy that he promoted to uh, full professor here. This view is from my office. And uh, I like the green plant very much. It is an uh, image of the, not image, real, reality is uh, uh, the fertility and also the peace. So I like this uh, picture very much. And if we go further north to uh, Oist campus, there is a Yambal forest. There are more greens, probably. And there is uh, uh, the, uh, many kinds of the plants. And those many kinds of plants is the uh, research target of sade <laughs> <laughs> And uh, he is working on the plant from the undergraduate days. 
uh, in Kyoto. And uh, uh, when it was many years ago, probably. And uh, he was graduated from Kyoto University and uh, moved, get a master degree from there. And then for the PhD, he moved to Basel, Switzerland. And then uh, did another uh, plant biology where he was supervised by the, uh, this professor, uh, P. <laughs> Paskovsky, and then S is Saze. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is the uh, epigenetic genomic laboratory in, the, in Switzerland. Often they went to skiing. Of course, they, they, played, they did a lot of work in the laboratory, of course. And then after getting the PhD, he came back to Japan and then uh, joined into the Professor Kaktani's laboratory in the National Institute of Genetics, where he is working on the Arabitopsis and another great epigenetic scientist. And then uh, he, Sajid-san was, uh, got position in the National Institute of Genetics as an assistant professor in 2011, I think, no, 2000. Zero, yeah, 11 probably. No. <laughs> no, 2011, you joined here. <laughs> so, at the same time, I joined here. <laughs> so, anyway, he became uh, assistant, assistant professor in National Institute of Genetics and moved to OIST in 2011 and then uh, continued to work on the plant genetics. genetics. So, at, in the laboratory, he works with the plant. This is some kind of mutant of the Arabidopsis, bonsai mutant, probably. And then uh, uh, he works very well in the laboratory, but of course he has home, and at home uh, he is a good father and a husband, and he can make uh, soba noodle. Uh, that is uh, required technique, I think, and also strength of the making the uh, cutting or the making the uh, pan. The, that, so, but I like the eating. <laughs> For me, it, not making, eating the noodle with the sake is much fun, fun of me. And then he, after uh, the work, he often go to the, um, uh, this is Okinawa city, and the uh, name is uh, Adachiya, probably Izakaya. Maybe you can enjoy there. And then, uh, I don't know how often he goes there, but anyway. <laughs> but I, I once joined, very, very, very enjoyable. And then I want to go to a couple of slides uh, about his science. And uh, this is uh, epigenomic uh, modification and uh, gene structure, uh, chromosomal structure is uh, somehow controlled by the epigenetic, epigenetic modification. This is, uh, 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 mechanism of the epigenetic uh, degradation, modification. Many, de many mechanisms is behind. And also, this is a result of the epigenetic uh, regulation, uh, modif modification. And uh, this, in this case, probably better to be explained by Sajesan. This is a phenotype of the plants, uh, disease phenotype, probably, but liver dying. So maybe I want uh, then from here, I want to ask Sarisan to talk about the more professional things. And then uh, I look forward to your great success in the OIST camp, OIST, uh, as a OIST professor. Please, Sarisan. Okay, Dr. Yamamoto, thank you very much for kind introduction. Uh, he already talked about my research, but uh, today I would like to briefly introduce our research, what we are doing in the OIST for 10 years or 11 years. So as the Yamamoto sensei showed, so we are currently like 10 people, including the five postdocs and two students, one technician and one administrator. So this is a the latest picture. So this is showing the hierarchy in the laboratory. <laughs> <laughs> so 
we have two main research goals. The first is, of course, epigenetic, to understand epigenetic mechanisms, which I will explain in this lecture, that distinguish between genes and transposable elements, which also I will explain, and understand the, their biological significance for plant adaptation and genome evolution. And second goal is to contribute to the Okinawa society by using our specialty, plant genomics. So then first start is what is epigenetics? So to understand the epigenetics, we need to start from genetics. So probably you know about the DNA, which is inside the nucleus in the cells. And the DNA encodes the, some, the information important for production of the proteins, which is the, written by the genetic code. So DNA is a heredity material that encodes genetic information. So in the case of genetics, there are several genes encoded in the DNA strings. Then if there's a change in DNA, it causes sometimes change in the output proteins, which cause the changes in the phenotypes of organisms sometimes. So in genetics, changes in phenotypes can be explained by changes in DNA sequence. In contrast, epigenetics, epi means originally above or over, over genetics. So there are several definitions about epigenetics, but my favorite one is this one. So the study of mitotically and or meiotically heritable changes in gene function that cannot be explained by changes in DNA sequence. So we study something which is not associated with DNA sequence changes. So this mitotically or meiotically is a bit complicated, so I don't go into detail today. So if you want to learn more about epigenetics, please come to my epigenetic class in term three every year. So DNA does not exist as a naked molecule in the cells, but it's attached to the protein called histones and forming this kind of bead strings like structure which is called chromatin. And one unit is called nucleosome. And as Yamamoto sensei said, so this chromatin is uh, important for transmission of the epigenetic information. So in DNA, the, the DNA determines genotype, but this chromatin, chromatin, DNA, histone, and other protein complex can determine epigenotype. And eventually this epigenotype determine the phenotypes of cell, tissue, and individuals. So basically what we are studying is that uh, modification of this chromatin, modification means chemical modification of chromatin, like methylation of DNA or methylation, phosphorylation, acetylation, there are various the chemical modification on the histone proteins, which are attached to DNA and also the reorganization of nucleosome position, sometimes called chromatin remodeling. This chromatin modification in the genome-wide scale is called epigenome. So this is one of the target we are studying every day. And the other target we are very interested, at, or at least I'm interested, is the transposons, or sometimes called transposable element, or TEs. So this is very interesting, the element which exists within the genome of many or almost all organisms. This transposon was first identified by Dr. Barbara McClintock in 1940s or 50s, even before the solution of DNA structure. And this transposon is kind of parasite stay in the genome. And it can move around within the genome. <laughs> So, and sometimes it can be inserted into the functional gene and disrupt the function. So this is the cone which the McClintock used. And this is the strain which originally have the purple pigment in the kernels. So this is the normal state. But if the transposon, this T is transposon, 
is inserted within the, this, the pigmentation genes. It interrupts the function. And for example, this, those colors are not produced, and cyanide is not produced. But sometimes it can still go out. Then it can restore the function of the gene. Then you can see those stop spots, means that those are sectors which does not have transposon anymore. So as I mentioned, this transposons are very ubiquitous in the eukaryotes, not only in plants. And there are several kinds of the transposon, including retro transposon or DNA transposons. This retro transposon is very similar. Some of them are very similar to like retrovirus, like HIV. And for example, in the case of human, our genome, half of our genome is occupied by this parasite transposon. And also mice, Drosophila, C. elegans. In the case of Arabidopsis, it's about 10% of the genome is transposon. And this transposon can cause many effects for gene function in the genome. For example, so this is a grape, a wine grape. So this is Cabernet, the strain has this gene for pigmentation, but when the retro transposon is inserted in the promoter region of this gene, it affects the gene function and makes Chardonnay the variety. And after some rearrangement, it causes another type of the, the variety. And also same for blood orange. And people, without knowing the presence of transposon, the for a long time, people are, they are using transposon as a source for genetic variation. Like in the very long time ago, in maybe 17th century in Japan, there are a lot of breeders to produce very unique morning glories, which are eventually caused by the variation in transposons. Or also color variations, carnations, are also produced by this transposon insertion. Those transposon insertions sometimes inserted within the genes, we call it intragenic. So intergenic is between genes, but intragenic is within the genes. And those intergenic transposons are very common in eukaryotic genomes. So this is the, the one of the, the cartoon from the, this review. This is mammalian genome, and you can see this orange or purple or blue. Those are retro transposons. Most of them are degenerated pieces of the transposon, which are actually present within the gene. So these regions are called the introns. So it is said that 60% of the T's in both human and mouse are located in intronic sequence. Sometimes those intronic or intragenic sequence can have a regulatory role of the associated gene. So means that sometimes they are behave like parasite, but also sometimes organisms somehow capture or domesticate those transposon for a host function. The famous example of this one, so probably you know about this. So during the, the indus, industrial revolution in UK, so they used a lot of coal for, for the, in the factory, and the surface of the, the tree became darker because of the, the coal burning. And it caused the quick adaptation of the moss, and some the population start to have more darker phenotype, which is actually caused by the transposon insertion in the intronic regions. So then there are a lot of the potential impacts between transposon and genes. So let's assume this red is transposon sequence. So transposon sequence can be incorporated into the gene transcript or Sometimes transposon sequence has a regulatory element to stop transcription. It causes the aberrant polyadenylation, premature polyadenylation, or sometimes it also produces the aberrant RNAs from internal promoter. So one of the questions we are having is that how those intragenic transposons are epigenetically controlled? So to study this, we use this Arabidopsis as a model system. So this plant is very small, which is a family of like the cabbage or radish. 
and very easy to study and many researchers use this the plant as a model and we have a lot of the information, public data and resources to study this. So then I'd like to introduce our recent study about gene transposon interaction using Arabidopsis. So we try to understand how gene and transposon sequence are expressed together. It's called chimeric gene transposon transcript. Chimera is like a monster which has different part of the animals. So in this case, we mean, mean chimeric gene transposon transcript is that if transposons are inserted in within the gene or surrounding regions, which can be transcribed together with the genes. So this work was recently published, mainly the work by Leo, Jeremy, and Munisa. So to do this, we use the technology called nanopore direct RNA sequencing. So this technology is relatively new. So by using some flow cells, which contain a lot of proteins, which can capture the RNA molecules. And when RNA molecules going through the spore, it can lead the sequence of the nucleotide. So then we can get relatively long the sequencing information, which is very useful for the resolving the structure of RNA. Sometimes it's very difficult using, by using the short read, like Illumina sequencing. So like in average, we can get 1 KB, 1.2 KB length of RNA sequence information. So then this is one example. So there's a gene called RPP4, which I will show later again. So this gene is a bit complex, start from here to here. So we use the official annotation. So annotation means that information showing that from gene starts from here to here, somebody they determined by using several the information. And here, this red is transposon. You can see transposon in intron of this gene and also three prime region of this gene. In addition to this official the gene annotation, we have the transcript annotation. This is also the big effort by the consortium. And uh, they update the information. Several, the several years. So then this is also the annotation here. So the annotation stop here. But uh, our data shows that actually this gene can be transcribed into this transposon region, or even the gene, which was initially thought to be another gene. But actually, this is the gene of the last exon of this gene. So you see a lot of variation in the transcription. Even some of them are not properly spliced, or some of them are skipped from here to here or here to here. So it's very complex. And also, we found that those, the transcript, chimeric transcript, gene transposon chimeric transcript, are not properly captured so far. So we have this data now. And also, we, this is wild type data. And we also have the new data about the mutant, which can change the displacing pattern. So there are a lot of the outcomes or consequences of this, the variations. And it's very complex. And I also didn't know before starting this. And but basically, so there is an event called splicing. So after transcription of the RNA, it can be spliced to fuse exon regions. And those, the splicing can make a lot of variation in the transcript. And let's assume this red is transposon and the black is ex, uh, gene exon, like in, in intron retention or splice, alternative splicing site or exon skipping. So this is splice based event. And also, if the transcription start sites are shifted or transcription termination site are shifted, you also get the different splicing uh, transcript isoform like this. So if transposon has uh, another transcription start site, it can make the variation in the transcript. So it's very complex, but uh, very talented. The postdoc, Jeremy, developed the new pipeline, bioinformatic pipeline. It's called Parasite, which is available publicly. So it can, so by using this pipeline, he can automatically detect this event 
and also identify the transposon sequence within the, this direct RNA sequencing data. So basically, he classified another type of the transcript, but today it's not so much important. So we found this T gene transcript, about 11,000 in wild type Arabidopsis, so which is about the 3,000 gene loci, corresponding to 3,000 gene loci associated with this the transcript in Arabidopsis genome. So there are several examples. I don't go into detail. And we found many T intron retention event or T alternative TSS or T alternative TTS termination site, which are quite high number. So then what kind of genes are producing this kind of T gene transcript? So then we found that the genes involved in killing of cell or other organisms, cell killing, defense response to fungus or response to fungus. So those genes are actually the important for the plant defense against, against pathogens. So we are happy to find this because actually it is already known that those genes involved in pathogen resistance are associated with transposons. So in the case of the plants, plants does not have do not have the immune system as mammals or animals, but uh, instead they have the gene called resistance genes, which is kind of the genes which recognize specific pathogens, almost one-to-one -one interaction. So plants need to have many this resistance gene, R gene, to cope with different pathogens. To have this, they have this R gene cluster as a cluster sometimes. And for this cluster formation, transposon is very important because transposon is very repetitive sequence. So it can actually the enhance the recombination or shuffling of those genes. And it is known that the, this R gene cluster is the most the rapidly evolving locus in plant genomes. So this is the, some example we focused in this study. So this is the case of this T alternative TTS. So transposon red is present in three prime regions, three prime UTR regions. And this is actually the gene which I showed this RP before, but in different orientation, another orientation, sorry. It's complication. So gene start from here, then this red is transposon sequence, but uh, in wild type, the transcription going through this transposon sequence. But we found several epigenetic mutants which cannot produce this the T gene chimeric transcript and only stop the original gene TSS, TTS site like this. So this is wild type. So this is another gene. So you can see that this is the gene and in three prime UTR region, this led to its transposon sequence. And in wild type, they produce T gene, the chimeric transcript, but in the mutant, they stop. So I don't go into detail about this mutant, but they are important for epigenetic regulation. So then the Leo, the another postdoc, tried to see how this changes in the T gene, the transcript, affects pathogen response. Then, so Dr. Yamamoto showed this one. Actually, this is, uh, this is showing the degree of infection. So white is more resistant, and darker green means that there are a lot of infections going on. So there are several strains in Arabidopsis, which does not have this gene itself. So this pathogen is specially recognized by this R gene, resistance gene, RPP4. So without this gene, they have a lot of infection. And in white type, Colombia, as a comparison, the infection is something like this. But in this mutant, you can see that more white means that they show more resistance. Means that, so by producing this chimeric gene transcript, the plants try to suppress the response to the pathogen. So it's somehow a bit counterintuitive because if you have more resistance, it would be good. But as I showed, 
those genes cause the cell death, actually. So plants try to kill the infected cells to prevent spreading of the pathogen into the neighboring cells. So if too much activation of these genes cause kind of autoimmune response. So rather probably we guess that suppressing of those genes would be also ad uh, adaptive to the environment. So anyway, so this is the summary of the first part. So we did the direct RNA sequencing and we found about 3,000 gene loci which produce T gene chimeric transcript. And the epigenetic changes can change the splicing pattern or isoforms. And in some loci we found that the stress can change the transcript. So we don't know yet, but uh, maybe the environmental stress can change epigenetic marks, which eventually produce the alternative transcript form, which might be useful for stress response. So this, those data are publicly <coughs> available. So we also the upload those data in our OIST website. Okay, then second part, I would like to introduce our, the project about the Okinawa society by using plant genomics approaches. So as you know, the one of the important mission of OIST is the contribution to the sustainable development of Okinawa. So Okinawa is very famous as a blue zone and a lot of centenarian. Centenarian means that the people can live longer than 100, 800 years old and very famous for longevity. But after World War II, it's a bit affected because of one reason might be because of the changes in the lifestyle, including diet. And especially, the, it's called Okinawa crisis, which is related to the changes in lifestyle. And now the people in Okinawa are suffering the lifestyle related disease, like liver disease or diabetes or hypertensive disease. And among, so in the case of Japan, there are 47 the prefecture, but uh, both female and male are quite high, have higher the, or highest the mortality risk in Okinawan population like this. So this is the data from 2020 and also like COVID. So then when we joined the OIST almost 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, there's a project called Functional Rights Project started. So in this project, we tried to develop new rice strain, which is related to the, the lifestyle diet in the people, not only in Okinawa, but in also the Asia. So by using the rice strain called Amiromochi rice strain, or we called Wakishi A rice. So this rice strain was originally the developed by the Professor Sato in Kyushu University, he already retired. And this rice strain can accumulate resistance starch. So, and this, this resistance starch is accumulated because of two changes in two genes called Wakishi and AE. So this amiromochi strain has two mutations in the, in the genome. So in the case of rice, there are two types of starches accumulating. One is called amylopexin, the other one is amylose. So this is the, the glucose, basically, and linear glucose and branching glucose. And normal rice, about 80% amylopexin and 20% amylose. And if you go to market, you can find glutinous rice, it's sticky rice. Actually, this is also the mutant, the one of the gene, Wakishi is mutated, and this glutinous rice doesn't have amylose, and that's why it's very sticky. And in the case of this amylomochi, this Wakishi A rice, it has another mutation, additional mutation. It causes more long branched amylopexin, which causes the resistance to the human digestion. So then basically as a geneticist, what I did, what we did was, so this, the Wakish A amylomachi strain was close to local, the 
rice strain called yuga fumuchi. So to, to develop new rice strain suitable for Okinawa production. So crossing, crossing, crossing. So ideally, we would like to get new variety, which contains resistant starch, but other genetic background is the local yuga fumuchi. So then we did so-called molecular breeding. So we use the genome information, rice genome information for this the, the crossing. So if so let's assume this the this red is a mutation present in the original amiromochi and this is the the yuga fumochi. Then if you cross the half become the yuga fumochi and half remain the amiromochi. Then Again, you cross, so once you cross the half of the genome become the depressed. And then second cross, we call back cross one, back cross two, then again half. So we repeated this, oh, sorry. So if you do this five times, theoretically, the 3% of the genome should remain and 97% of the genetic background should be depressed by the other strain. But this doesn't work like this because this is the, the great the finding of Mendel. So if you cross this one, you will get this kind of random independent assortment of gene loss. It's, it's called so-called Mendel's second row. So you get the progenies, which does not have, for example, this one of the gene or some of them does not have at all, or like this. So then here we use the genome information. So we developed a genome worker in genome-wide and try to find the progenies, which has both mutation, inherited both mutation. So maybe this one, this one, but we would like to have the progeny, which has more the replacement of this. So then we select this one. So this is the reason why you are not the same with your sister and brother. So this is because of this random assortment. So anyway, so we select efficiently the strains which are having the repressed background. So then the, this, this process is, is, is not so, taking not so long time because, so if you grow the rice in Okinawa, you can harvest twice, second crops. In mainland Japan, only once. But, but if, you, if, you, if, you, if you use the growth chamber, maximum we can do like uh, five generations. So this is not so taking time, but the problem is that we need the field test to register this rice strain, and it took time. And so as a, a geneticist, we somehow stop somewhere here. And uh, then after this agricultural part, we had a lot of support from OIST innovation system led by the Ichikawa-san and Nagamine-san. And also we had a lot of help from the Onna village. And then we checked after developing this new OIST rice, then indeed it can accumulate the resistance starch compared with normal rice. And also this year there is a report about the clinical trial about this rice to the, the patient with type 2 diabetes, and it shows that it can suppress the increase of the blood glucose or insulin after eating. So then the, this June, with the new president, Karin, we announced new rice strain as a chulaotome. So this is one of the project. And the other project about the mangrove, so you may know about mangrove, it can grow the very extreme condition in the coastal area, including Okinawa and subtropical region, a tropical region in the world. And for the plant biologist, it's very interesting plant, but because it has the very strong tolerance against salt or heat and the UV light. So Okinawa or Japan is the northern limit of the mangrove. And in the case of Okinawa, we can find major, the three major the mangrove species, Brugera gymnorisa and Candelia ovata and Rhizophora styrosa. 
So I took this figure from one review. So it is believed that maybe 55 million years ago, there was a global warming happen. And it caused, so this is a sea level, increased sea level. And during that time, mangrove might have diverged from other species. And we just studied this Bruguera, which the diverged relatively earlier than other mangrove species. So this project was done by Martin sitting here. <laughs> so she sequenced this mangrove, and the genome size was something about 300. And actually, there are already several reports about the other mangrove species. So mangrove has relatively smaller genome compared with the normal trees. And also, she did the field experiment. So she went to the river in Kintan called Okukubi River. And she collected the samples from the ocean side, which has the relatively high salt concentration in the, in the so, uh, soil, and also the bit more upstream, the area, which has relatively low the salt concentration. So interestingly, so even though it's the same species, they show totally different morphology. So the one in ocean side is like bush, but in river side, you see like five, six meter long trees. So then she did the RNA-seq data, and she found a lot of the changes in gene expression. I don't go into detail. And also we did the in natural, in natural means the samples from natural, in natural epigenome analysis. So we check DNA maturation. And interestingly, we found that especially transposon has higher DNA maturation in salt conditions. So this is another project. And lastly, I'd like to introduce this project. This was also done by Martin. So probably you know the tree called Fukugi. It's uh, originally called Garcinia subediptica. So it's the very traditional tree in Okinawa. And if you go to the north of the Churaumi Aquarium, there is a beautiful village called the Bisezaki, where you can find the lot of these trees along the house. So this, the Fukugi is traditionally planted as a windbreak forest in Okinawa. So then we were contacted by the people in the Okinawa Prefecture, the Agricultural Research Institute, and they want to distinguish between male and female tree. Actually, it has male and female sex. And also in campus, you see a lot of this Fukugi tree planted along the street. But maybe you never care about, about whether it's a male or female. But some people care because especially the female tree makes the, the fruit after 10 years. And sometimes it makes the, some, the smells or it attract also the, the insects. So the male trees are more appreciated. Sorry, I'm not really mean about this. But uh, so then they want to distinguish the male and female in early stage, but uh, so far they can know this after 10 years, fully grown up the tree. Then first time, for the first time they can distinguish male or female. So then we sequenced this, the pottery sequenced this, the Fukugi genome, and the Martin tried to find male specific or female specific piece of DNA, and we could find some regions which are only present in male. So we can now distinguish male and female at the very early seedling stages. So this is another project which is related to Okinawa. So OK, so thank you very much for your attention and your time to coming to this lecture. And I'm happy to take questions.